his throne. Come, let us adore him. Behold a king, nothing can compare. Come, let us adore him. Hey, everyone, welcome back to Christ of the Cure. This is episode 122, I believe. Um, this is Hermeneutics Part 2. And I was thinking about um, the subject matter, because we covered quite a bit um, in about 30 minutes last time. Because I was actually going to try to do it all in one episode, and I was like, you know what? We'll just cut it in half. And so here we are. And I want to kind of say that we'll, we'll go over the rest of my general um, topics that I have laid out. And then we'll kind of talk about some of this in application. Because... Um, what I've realized is that people will hear these presentations on hermeneutics and they're like, this is complex. I can't do this. Um, you start talking about presuppositions. You start talking about genres and stuff like that. There are firstly tools, but then there's kind of the reality that we talked about before that it's, it's really just logic and observation. Observation is the key and observation will save you a lot of trouble. And also just, not isolating texts, and we'll get into that here in a little bit. But first, I wanted to begin by talking about the bird's eye view versus the worm's eye view, right? So if you're a worm and you're looking at a building, all you can see is the building. You can see how how tall it is, and you can make some observations about it. But the problem is that you're limited to that one building. So for the most part, we want to look at a text from the bird's eye view, where you're overlooking the whole city. Instead of just seeing one part, you see the whole thing. And so that's kind of how we want to approach books whenever we're looking at, um, say, uh, James. Instead of looking at one word, for example, which is kind of extreme, but it's an example. Instead of looking at one word and just focusing on that one word and building our theology of James off of that one word, we want to know what James is saying entirely. And then that word will fall into place. So this is basically saying that we should um, observe the text in its entirety. You know, we, we look at what this word means but we also need to connect it to what it means in the, in the paragraph, in the chapter, in the book. And then eventually, as you start getting um, you know, more systematic, then what does it mean in the Bible as a whole? So what are the rules of hermeneutics? You have literary context, you have historical or cultural background, word meaning, grammatical relationships, literary genre. So context, what is context? Well, context is the whole of which some piece is a part. So whenever you hear someone saying, you're ripping that out of context, they're implying that you're ripping this piece of the puzzle out of a bigger picture. So that's essentially what context is. Sometimes people throw around the word, um, and I think that they're misusing it. But it's really just saying um, that this has bigger, uh, this has surrounding details that matter in terms of what it means. Um, For genre You have, of course, you know, the type of writing it is. In scripture, you have letters, you have poetry, you have narrative. Uh, History, of course, is, you know, events that occur in the past and culture is, you know, the way of life, the value systems, the customs. You know, for example, we talked about uh, in an introduction to Romans, uh, I think that was on my Instagram page, uh, which, by the way, I've been slacking on that series because I've just been too slammed to do my own personal study on that. Um but we talked about the idea of the patron system where you give a gift and essentially that gift is an extension of friendship. And so to accept the gift is to um, say that you're friends and then it makes a lifelong relationship. And so we talked about that and that's a cultural thing. You know, you can kind of get into that with apologetics too, with, with slavery. There's, there's cultural differences that need to be um, taken into consideration. So context matters. It always matters. Um, in fact, I would argue that most times misinterpretations can be solved either by looking uh, one or two verses up or just the paragraph in general. It usually solves a problem. Um, so if you follow me on Instagram, you know my favorite example for the reality that context matters. And it's Matthew 4, 9. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Amazing. You will get what you want. You will get all these things, whatever that is. Um You will get all these if you just worship him. Oh, the problem is that the context says that, again, the devil took him to the very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. 
And then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship and love the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. So there's an example where you have this one middle text that could be ripped out and be applied in various contexts. Um, but the, the, the verse before and the verse after is like, no, this has a meaning. Now, the, not this particular text, but if you're looking at a text where it says something that's true, um, but it's not actually in that particular text, then just don't use it. Don't use a proof text that doesn't apply to the subject you're actually discussing. And that's kind of where you get to the point that if what you're presenting is biblical, there are texts that address it. There are texts that hermeneutically you can say, this is what it teaches. So you don't need a proof text if if you have that in mind, um, or if it's a biblical concept to begin with. So context, first off, you have a word, you know, strengthens me, but you have a target text. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So you have the target text along with the word. But then you have the immediate context, right? I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound in any circumstance. I have learned the secret of facing plenty of hunger, abundance, and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So you have the target text. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And then you have the immediate context. And then you have the whole paragraph. And then you get into, well, the letter of Philippians. And then you get into the Pauline corpus and then the New Testament and then the entire Bible. Uh, But there's things to consider historical, geographical, cultural. Um, so we don't want to just look at that one line. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. We want to look at the context and then eventually we want to see what the context of Philippians is, what his overall message is, and then how it relates to everything else. So examples of genre, because genre can become a big topic, particularly in the old Testament and the new Testament is a little bit more limited. And we'll get to that here in a second. But, uh, for genre, you have historical An example is Exodus. Uh, you have prophetic and that's, uh, Isaiah. You have a, the letters, which is Ephesians, poetry, uh, Songs of Solomon. Um, so what type of text we are reading plays a role in our interpretation. We talked a little bit about this in the first part where you logically do this when you're reading a newspaper versus when you're reading Edgar Allan Poe or you're reading, I don't know, name a poet. Uh, and so genre is important, and we recognize that. And that applies to the Bible, too. We can't just rip a text out of context and start... Um, it's like taking allegory and the psalm, you know, um, God, you are my shield. That must mean God is a shield. Well, figuratively, of course. There's language there. There's genre there. We we recognize that. We know it's absurd to say that God is literally a shield. So these are things that we know. And so a lot of hermeneutics, I think, is intuitive. But um, we just need to remember that. I think that's the main uh, apologetic for hermeneutics is remembering that God isn't irrational, and that he didn't give us some weird mystical puzzle that we have to solve like a lot of books seem to suggest. But moving on to historical background, really the questions you need to ask when you're looking at historical context is who was this written to, who was it written by, when was it written, and why was it written? So these are the questions you kind of want to ask whenever you're looking at a text. Um, whenever I've looked at different hermeneutics approaches, it, it kind of suggests that you do it with every paragraph which is good to remind yourself of that. But I mean, if you have, if you're studying one book and you already know it, just keep it in mind. You know, you don't have to continuously regurgitate that. So how do you put it together? Well, the steps of hermeneutics, you have identifying the genre of a passage, determining the big picture or the main theme of a paragraph, make observations. Observations are key. It's all about the observations. Really it is. Um, Observations will help you so much. Um, I guess it's a little bit of an overstatement to say it's all about the observations, but really there needs to be an emphasis on observations. Um, So you make observations about structure, about people, about words being used, about repeated words, um, about, you know, idioms or figurative language or just, it just goes beyond. And we'll look a little bit at that in a second. And then you interpret the meaning of the passage and of course, you want to you want to apply it. You want to meditate on it while you interpret. Meditating in the biblical sense, which is chewing on a text, thinking through the text. Um, I have a whole episode on that. I um, can't remember the episode number. It's one of my earlier ones uh, that's on. It should be up. And then you want to apply uh, this to our lives. Now, one thing to say right here before we go deeper is that applications. You have one objective interpretation. And a lot of people are like, Ooh, it's brave to say that, but 
but there is one objective interpretation. Otherwise, there's no objective interpretation. Um, but there are many applications, um, specifically like whenever you start thinking about people where they are in their situations, you can get branched off into how many applications the text can have, but those applications are only meaningful in hermeneutics whenever you're properly interpreting the text. So identifying the genre. So what type of literature are we looking at? So we have Old Testament genres, right? Narrative, law, poetry, wisdom, prophecy. In the New Testament, you have gospel, history, epistles, and apocalyptic. You can say there's some um, apocalypse literature in the Old Testament too, but they're mostly like sections within Daniel, things like that. Um, so what type of literature are we looking at? That's that's really what we're looking at. So in the Old Testament, it gets more complicated because within the genres, you have subgenres. For example, underneath narrative, you have reports, you have battle reports, construction reports, which you can see those are all similar, but they can fall under di different categories. And so a battle report will give you a battle report. It's it's very intuitive. Uh, heroic narrative. You have an epic, you have a cosmic, you have a farewell narrative. And so there's different things about these structures that you can see. Um, in law, man, law becomes a big topic. And I almost don't want to go there right now. Um, for the most part, you have, um, you know, prohibitions, curses, um, conditions, legal series and instructions um, and how people break the law up sometimes are applied in hermeneutics uh, in terms of subgenre. But I would say for the most part, just think of um, how the law genre works in general. There are stipulations, there are conditions, there are um, consequences, things like that. So looking at poetry, you have, you know, prayer and songs. And within prayer, you have protest, royal protest. Um, th these are all technical words, which if you want to go deep into the weeds, then for sure, you know, you want to look into that. Uh, and there are subgenres of each category of these. So I don't want to get too bogged down in that. But you can recognize some of this. Like uh, whenever we look at songs... And you read through the Psalms, you'll see different types. You'll see Thanksgiving, you'll see uh, laments, you'll see mixtures, you'll see wisdom literature. So you can recognize these. It's just whether or not you feel the need to categorize them as you're going through them. Um, there's books on the Psalms. And the whole thing is like, how do we break these up? Uh, some of it's meticulous. And I don't know that all of it is necessary, if I'm honest. Um, regardless. Uh, you have different types of prophecy. You have disaster, salvation, commission, narrative. We can recognize that. We we can recognize that intuitively. This prophecy is about disaster. This prophecy is about the Messiah. So that's something that we can say there. And for wisdom, you have the Proverbs, you know, where it's, uh, it's either descriptive or it's prescriptive or it's instruction or reflection. Then there's like uh, speeches as well. For the New Testament, the subgenres uh, are usually in form meaning that uh, the letters or the Gospels will have subgenres within them. And we recognize this in the Gospels. We see parables. Bam, there we go. There's a there's kind of a subgenre there. Uh, an example with the epistles are that you have exhortations, you have introductions, family letter, creeds, and hymns. You have a diatribe, which is basically laying out argumentation. Um, so they're not as prominent. These subgenres are, are not as prominent in the New Testament. Um but literary devices and grammatical structures act as minor subgenres, as some would say. So you can kind of, you can you can again get bogged down in that if you wanted to to, to break it up in different sections. Um, so moving past that, what is the genre? What type of text am I looking at in general? I think stick with the, the general, and then as you approach various sections of the general genre, like if I'm looking at Genesis, and I think there's a couple songs. It's either Exodus or Genesis where there's a couple songs in the middle of it and a couple of poetic um, bits. When you're reading through that, deal with that whenever you get to it, but just keep in mind the general um, genre until you need to address the subgenres. So determine the big idea. What is the theme of the passage that I'm looking at? The big idea is the primary theme or the idea that is being conveyed in a given passage, right? So how do you do this? Well, you reread the passage. Uh, one of the best things you can do is read and reread and read and reread on repeat to understand something. Um, whenever I was first saved, I think it was a John MacArthur sermon. And he was saying, you know, just reread 
uh, every day for 30 days. And so I started with first John every day for 30 days. I read first John. And by the end of that 30 days, I had a good idea of what the general ideas were of the book. Was I an expert? No, but going back and reading through it because I knew the general idea, whenever I went to go do a deeper study, I was like, Oh, this makes sense because I know the bigger theme. That's important. Just read and reread. If you have a paragraph and you're having a hard time with it, just keep reading it. Take a break. Maybe go back, reread it, spend the time to chew on it. We have gotten so used to just Googling answers. And I'll talk about commentaries here in a little bit. Don't do it. Reread it. Wrestle with it. That's the key. Wrestle with it. Uh, look at the context surrounding your paragraph. If you can't figure out what the, what the idea is in the paragraph, look at what it's saying around the paragraph. Um, and again, what is the right, the theme as a whole? How does this paragraph fit into the theme as a whole? And, and what is the point that's being made here? So then you can get into the structure, right? Um, how does the author lay out the point or the argument? Um, are there phrases or words that are, are stressed or repeated? For example, if you did a word study on the flesh in Galatians, it's all over the place. And sometimes it means different things in different places. And so you, you want to look at that. Or if you look at Romans, I believe Romans uh, 7 and 8, chapter 7 and 8, there's a big repetition of the word law, and there's different kinds of laws being mentioned. And so you you look for patterns like that. Is there a point already made, but that's restated in a different way? You actually see this quite a bit, where you, you'll see a line where a point is made, and then on the next line, it's the same point, but it's either phrased differently or it expands on it. it happens a lot in Proverbs. Uh, you read through the Proverbs, you'll see that a lot. Um, does the author use any literary devices or structures? Literary devices are just abounding. You know, uh, pluck out your eye if it causes you to sin. We talk about this all the time because people throw that at us. Uh, if someone doesn't recognize it as hyperbole, then there, there's an issue there. It's figurative language. It's stressing the point. And so we need to be able to recognize it as well. So then we interpret it. What does the text mean? What does the passage mean? What are the implications? You know, what does this have? What is this? What what does this mean in the scope of theology or God, Christ, or, or whatever it is? Because, um, you know, there are, we need to be able to recognize progressive revelation as well whenever we're reading the Old Testament. We need to be able to say, well, what are the implications of this passage? We don't want to mean like, oh, this means that the triune God, da 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 We don't want to just jump to that. We want to say, what does this mean in its original context? And then as we branch out, we can get into the systematic connections. Hopefully, what I just said uh, made enough sense for that. Um Another thing is, can this interpretation be validated? And how does this passage affect my soul? What does this mean for me? So you have this theological reflection, and then that theological reflection becomes inward reflection. If you're missing the link between the head and the heart, then you're doing it wrong. If you're not moving the theology from your head to your heart, then then you're missing a big component of what it means to study the Bible. Now, this is, of course, from the perspective I'm, I'm speaking to people who are trying to study the Bible for themselves. There is something to be said about academic studies. Whenever I do research, I'm looking at a topic, I'm examining the topic, I'm not applying it all to my soul immediately. I'm getting a systematic idea, and then I apply it. So there's, there's something to be said about different settings. For the most part, if you're not getting anything out of the study, if it's not changing you and moving you to love God and love your neighbor or to understand God or understand your neighbor, then it's not doing what it's supposed to do. We, we need to remember that. I think that's extremely important. Um, and I say this out of personal experience. Um, I remember you know going through a lot of study, and I knew a lot of theology, but without applying it to your heart, all it does is make you arrogant, makes you rude, and it just shows that you don't know what you're talking about. If you can't say that this is real enough to affect you, then you don't know it well enough. I would say that. Um, hopefully that made sense as well. It's kind of a weird morning for me. Um, so application, you know, what does, how does the author firstly apply this to his listeners? And a lot of the times you'll see application being made within a text. So that's kind of nice when that happens, but how, how does he apply it to the text? You know, um, f- for example, uh, whenever you see it like a therefore in scripture, therefore is everywhere. Look for those therefores. But you'll usually see a therefore following a big point, and he's saying, therefore, because of this point, do this, this, and this, or uh, realize this, this, and this, right? Uh, and then you you see, um, how can I take this and put it into practice? That's that's application. It's all about practice. And then how can others put it into practice? 
How should we live because of this passage? How can this passage shape my mind and my desires and move me towards God? And that's kind of one of those things where you're either moving towards God or you're moving away from God. Our goal is to always be moving towards God. And so how does this passage help us to do that? So practice and application, you know, uh, Second Chronicles 7, 11 through 22, I've had on my Instagram page for a while, so I'm not going to go into that. Um, Psalm 1, let's look at that. So genre, the, the genre of Psalm 1 is poetry and wisdom. The big idea is the righteous prosper and the wicked perish, right? The observations, you have things like the blessings and the curses. You have the figurative language that says you know, the righteous will bear, bear fruit. The wicked are useless. So you have interpretation. Apart from the Lord and his instruction, there's nothing value of worth. And then, of course, you have the application. Abide and meditate upon the scriptures. Great application. I love the applications. It's going to sound weird where it says abide in God and abide in the word and abide, you know, in Christ and the Father and the Holy Spirit. And those are my favorite because uh, that's really what it all boils down to, isn't it? That's what it's all about. It's just abiding, abiding in him. That's, that's what it all, I, I just love it. Anyway, um, so historical observations. Well, the psalm has a Torah awareness, and it's acted as, uh, the Torah acted at like a spiritual nerve center, essentially, for Israel. Uh, psalm 1 acts as an introduction to the Psalter as a whole, and it begins the Torah. Um, so it's kind of like the opening book, and then you have the closing book, and then in the middle you have, uh, you know, uh, various uh, references to Torah. Uh, you have the Torah-specific psalms, you know, emphasizing meditation and correct living. Uh, but culturally, the, the type of poetry reflects a wisdom literature opposed to just being a song. Uh, and then you have the honor system. You have um, the involvement with the assembly within the text being mentioned um, and being cast out of the assembly. And so you can see a cultural thing there. So these are just ideas of how this looks, right? Um, literary, you have compare and contrast throughout the whole thing. Uh, you have... The, the righteousness and the sinner, and then il- illustrations are seen. You have various points where you uh, the tree is planted by water. That's an illustration or an analogy. Uh, similes can be seen just as well. And then you have grammatical. You have keywords, such as but, then, therefore, as, for. And it tells us basically the relationship between words and concepts, right? Um, and then, you, I mean, you can see this in verse 4, 5, and 6. So you'll have to go back and read read the psalm and, and see, you know, what I'm talking about. Uh, for application, before we kind of summarize and get into observations, um, application is important because, firstly, it's biblical. It refines our faith. It moves us to loving God in our neighborhood. And it's the result of truthfulness of the Word of God, convicting us and moving us. So the four-stage model of application is determine the meaning of the original application, evaluate specific applications, and determine whether or not those applications can transfer to us, um, if the original application is not, then you find a principle that can apply. And then from there, you have the, the various appropriate applications for today that implement those pr- principles. Um, one example that may or may not be good is, um, you know, again, pluck out your eye if it causes you to sin, you know, for the man who lusts in his heart and has committed adultery. So what does that mean for us? Well, the principle is simple. It's stay away from, from sin. Stay away from, do what you can to stay away from sin. So in our modern day, how can we apply that? Well, you know, my phone uh, becomes an issue. So let's get a program that blocks out pornography. Let's get a program that blocks out, um, you know, any kind of crude content. Or let's just delete apps or let's just minimize your phone. Do what you can to not sin is the principle. And so you can apply that to our day in many ways. Um so the use of the Bible is to formulate theology, preach, pastor, uh, gain information, understanding, and to formulate worship, right? Um, so here we have the summary of everything we said. We want to understand what the text meant in its original context by its author, what genre was, what the message was being conveyed. And then we can say, all right, we know what the text meant then. How can we apply it now? So this said, let's talk a little bit about all this, a lot of this, like, this is so overwhelming. What do you do with it? You, you look for patterns, you observe the text, you know, you look for emphasis. What is, what is the subject being described and why is it being emphasized? Look for repetition. Are there repetitions in words or phrases, um, circumstances or other patterns? 
Are there quotes from other parts of the Bible? How does how does the New Testament interpret this text of the Old Testament? Things like that. Look for relationships, you know, cause and effect. Is there a question? Is there an answer? A lot of times in Paul, you'll have him raise an argument, and then he'll answer the objection to the argument. He'll, he'll um, predict an argument, and he'll address it immediately. Um, what about comparisons? Are, are there comparisons or even contrast, right? Um, like the flesh and the spirit in Galatians 5. The flesh is this, the spirit is this. They're in opposition to, uh, to each other. And then we can get into to grammar, you know. Um, what words are, are here? What, what's happening with a verb? Who's acting with a verb? Uh, Romans 8, 28 through 30. Who is the one acting in those sections? Uh, what is the subject? What is the object? You know, what's the adjectives? What's describing the noun or the subject? Um, and then we look for prepositional pa- phrases. What does this pre- prepositional phrase mean? What does it mean to be in Christ? What does it mean to be um, for this? Or, or why does this say on and not in and things like that? Um, connections where the relationships and different pronouns. Um, but the, the big thing is questions, you know, asking questions and engaging with those questions. And you can summarize them with who, what, where, when, why, and so what, right? Um, so whenever you're looking at Galatians, who wrote Galatians? Well, Paul, who did he write it to? He wrote it to the, the individuals who were trying to impose law onto the Gentiles. Uh, so what was the purpose of it? Well, the purpose was to counter that. Uh, where was the purpose? Well, it was somewhere in, in Galatia, right? <laughs> um, when was it? Well, it was sometime around uh, the period where there were still struggles in the church. And so you can you can get more bogged down into the time frame of what's going on behind there. But in general, what when is this happening in terms of the biblical timeline? Um, why is this happening? Again, why is this something that needs to be addressed? And then so what? What does this mean for me, right? Um, but context, like we talked about, immediate context, what's before and after? What words connect? Paragraphs, for example, if you see a therefore, it's usually connecting different things. Like, look at Romans 8. Therefore, we uh, those who are in Christ have no condemnation, right? So where is that coming from? What comes before that connects because of that therefore? Um, let's see. For for big pictures, you can either chart, you can summarize, you can, you can try to find different pictures. You know, some people like the biblical book charts. I do not like those. I, I cannot stand them. I don't know why. Uh, I was... I was I had to make a couple in undergrad and in my master's program. And I just, I, I do not like the biblical book charts. Um, and then there's resources. And here's what I'll say. So for, for resources in general, the ones that you do want, um, whenever you're about to engage in the text are, you know, um, dictionaries and handbooks, um, atlases, but some people will throw commentaries in here. I don't want to throw commentaries in here. I want to say, leave the commentary to the side until you're done formulating your interpretation. Work at the text, wrestle with it, get the background from those other sources, like a good Bible dictionary. The Holman, uh, the Holman Bible dictionary is really good. I enjoy it. It's kind of my go-to now. A um, bunch of handbooks you can find. Um, there's resources everywhere. Just start Googling what is the best Bible dictionary? What is the best Bible handbook? What is the best Bible atlas? And then, of course, you have, like, the niche ones. Like, I have the Bible Alice of church history, you know? So it kind of shows you, like, uh, here's where Arianism spread in this time period. Really cool. You don't necessarily need that for what we're talking about here. Um, But for commentaries, some commentaries are all technical, right? Uh, Those are good. They're where they, they tell you about syntax or they tell you about grammar. They don't tell you an interpretation. Most commentaries don't do that. Um, most ma- most commentaries that you will buy um, are going to be the commentaries where they tell you the interpretation and the application. If you have those, hold them aside and do not read them until after you have worked with the text and you have tried to figure it out yourself. Then use the commentaries and see where you fall in the various commentaries. And then as you look at the commentaries and you look back at the text and you say, okay, well, obviously I was mistaken here. Um, because it's clear now that I read this commentary that I was mistaken, then you can kind of correct. But what this does is it helps you become less dependent on commentaries. Here's what I do. I will interpret a text, and then I will look at commentaries and study Bibles from different traditions and see how they interpret the text just to challenge my own. And then I will look at what church fathers have said about to challenge my own too as well. If I find something that's compelling, 
I will kind of start from scratch, re-examining where they're coming from, how they reason to it, if they give me enough information about that, and I'll correct it. And that does happen. I mean, it just does. In fact, it would be arrogant to assume that, nope, I don't need to look at any writings because I got it all figured out. That's just arrogance. It's, it's to reject the community of the Christian church, and I don't like that prospect. Work at the text yourself, then check it, and then just keep wrestling with it until you're like, okay, without a doubt, this is what this passage means. There are some passages where it's very difficult, and that's what it comes down to. Um, so that's what I think about commentaries. One last thing. Concordances are good for topical studies if you let the context determine what is being said. Um, I have seen concordances and online uh, lex lexicons being just abused. If you don't know the language, don't don't use it. If you really want to know, you know something about the language, just maybe look at the NET notes, uh, New English Translation notes. They're for free at Bible.org. Great translational notes, or even get the Bible. The Bible is beautiful, honestly. Do not talk about the languages if you don't know them. Chances are you're getting it wrong. And I don't want to say that to sound mean, um, but it happens a lot. And for, I mean, one common thing that happens all the time is the idea that in Greek, the masculine and the feminine, feminine must have bearing on the word, but that's not true. It's just not. For example, sin in Greek is feminine. And I have, I have seen people say that because it's feminine, because it's connected to Eve, no no, stop. That is not how we do things. Uh, sorry. And that's one of the reasons why you don't hear me talking about Greek, because I know Greek to an extent. I will never say I'm an expert because I'll never feel like an expert because of how complex it can be. I consult technical commentaries. I evaluate it as much as I can. For the most part, I'll I'll fall back on comparing the New American Standard Bible, the ESV, the NET, and then maybe the CSB. Because usually you'll find that translations will say the same thing in different ways, and that's what matters. Is it saying the same thing? Yeah. But Greek is a lot more broad, and so you can have different words that have the same meaning. But I would also say this, like whenever you're looking online, and you find an article that implies something about the Greek or Hebrew, I, I would just be wary. I mean, I, I've seen some things. There's this one thing um, I saw about the monster can. You've probably seen it, where, where the lady's saying that monster is something about the devil, unleash the beast, right? And so they, she points to the three symbols and saying that this means 666. The problem is that she's using individual numerical values which would be, you know, six plus six plus six in that context and saying that this means 666. The problem is that the Hebrew word for 666 is different. And the other problem is that the word was originally in Greek. And so uh, that's just one small example of way things get twisted. But, but there's a lot of things that happen where you can catch these kind of things. Um, my Greek professor stressed heavily that whenever you start seeing someone say um, that, um, you know, uh, etymology determines meaning, he's like, no, just don't. If you ever have someone who's saying that this word and this word make this one word, therefore it means these two different things and all that, it's wrong. Um, and he uses important as, a, um, as an example. Import means to bring things in, right? But important has nothing to do with that. And so you can... You can try to break words up like that, but it just doesn't work. Um, another thing is that people will see a verb and they'll go look it up in the lexical, but they'll, they'll completely miss that there's a range of meanings depending on context and depending on, and depending on how the word is structured. And I have to say, you know, I've looked back at some of the things that I've thought, um, and I'm just like, man, I shouldn't have said anything. So this is not to say... Don't do it because you're wrong. It's saying, uh, don't be like me and get it wrong. And then look back and say, man, that, that could have really ruined my credibility here, here, and here. Um, fortunately, I have strayed away from doing that in the podcast. 
I think I've mentioned uh, languages only whenever I'm absolutely certain. Um, other than that, you won't hear me talk too much about it um, for a while, I think. Um, this is just to say, be careful with word studies, and even in English. I mean, you can do this with English. Whenever you look up a word in English, you have to, you have to look it up in its context. If I look up false in English, and I assume that everything that's false is the same, I mean... You have different categories. You have false prophets. You have false gods. You have um, bear false witness. It means different things in different contexts. Context matters. That's that's the point. Um, hopefully that rant made some sense. But but regardless, let's talk resources real quick. If you go to my website, ChristTheCure.org, and go underneath resources to book recommendations, we have a couple books that can help you for Bible study. You have Grasping God's Word. It's a basic introduction to biblical interpretation that will make much more sense than the other one I'm about to mention. It is much simpler. It doesn't get into all the complex scholarly details. It's a good one. Um, I mean, you're not going to agree with everything you see in a book. That's just the reality. Uh, Introducing biblical doctrine. Um, It's more hefty and dense. I had a hard time reading it and I love dense books. It wasn't very fun. Um, The sections on uh, interpretation, canon, and history is worth it, I think. Um, it takes work to get through. And then you have uh, books for surveys. I would recommend an uh, introduction to the New Testament by Carson and Moo is thorough and it's excellent and it's my favorite. I have it in print and I like it so much that I'm probably going to buy it in accordance too because it really is just one of my favorite books. Um, it helps you with getting the, the the picture of each individual book. And then, of course, there's a survey of the Old Testament, Encountering the Old Testament by Arnold and Bayer. And I think it's fantastic. I haven't read too many Old Testament surveys. I love this one. That's it. For study Bibles, the ESV study Bible alone, it's introduction notes for each book and some of the articles in the back um, make it worth it. I'm a maps person. I love the ESV maps. I love charts, obviously. It's good for that. Absolutely love it. It does, it does a great job of giving you the information over and against interpretation 90% of the time, maybe. Maybe that's a little bit too generous. Um, but like I said, for if you're about to study a book, and you're like, man, I need some background on this. ESV Study Bible's introduction notes, awesome. Uh, Reformation Study Bible also has some great introduction notes. I like that they um, show you, you know, Christ in the book. They, they have a section in each, um, each introduction about how you can see Christ in each section. So those are some options there. If you go to my Instagram, you know, at Christ.is.the.cure, and you go to my highlights, there's a hermeneutics highlight. Scroll to like the last one, and there is a printable page of things you want to think of when you're doing hermeneutics. There's also other things in that series that may be uh, good here and there for you. But that one is a printout. You put it in your Bible, and it tells you, you know, what are you looking for? What do you do? Um And eventually, as you start looking at text, you'll just find that it starts becoming more natural because because it's not it's not out of sync with how we're designed. We're designed to use our brains. So just use your brain, use your brain with the spirit, pray with the spirit, walk through the scriptures with the spirit. Don't just neglect your brain and start hyper allegorizing everything. You might get something right here and there. But I mean, broken clocks right twice a day. Um, Other resources. Bible.org is a great resource. Biblical, actually, if I go straight to my website recommendation page, which I believe is functioning now. Yeah, yeah. Biblicaltraining.org. They have background information. They even have hermeneutic stuff, I believe. Go to biblicaltraining.org uh, and, you know, just look through what they have. It may have been an introduction on a book, but, you know, gather information about, about the book that you're about to study. Uh, Bible.org also has introductions, has outlines, has exegetical papers. Great resources for those. Um, really, a lot of places like Bible Gateway has a lot of commentaries for free. Um, you can find Church Father writings for free. The internet is an amazing tool. And because of that, we should not be biblically illiterate any longer. Those are some great tools. I hope that this has been helpful in some way. It's not as extensive as Undying Lights, uh, where he goes into word studies, where he goes into... Um, he, he goes, he goes deep. So go check out undying lights, uh, hermeneutic series. And I hope this was sufficient. Next week's episode will be on 
baptism in Acts. And I think a lot of people are going to be very disappointed about what I'm about to say. I don't think I'm going to go into all the different views of baptism in the way that I was originally planning. Originally, I was going to do baptism in the Gospels, Acts, Epistles, and then Catholicism, and then Eastern Orthodoxy, and then Lutheranism. I do not want the series to be that long. Um, So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do um, baptism in the Gospels, Acts, Epistles. We'll do an episode on baptismal regeneration, and then we'll do a uh, and that itself covering baptismal regeneration will deal with those other positions. Um, at this point, looking at uh, the different positions is something you could do on your own. Um, but for the most part, I think baptismal regeneration is really the crux of the matter. The The only difference. So baptismal regeneration separates, you know, me from uh, Eastern Orthodox, uh, uh, Episcopalian, Roman Catholicism, Lutheranism. And then you have, I mean, how they function in those groups are different. So maybe worth looking into there. But then you have Presbyterians and Baptists. That's where all the debate primarily is, it seems like. Um, and neither of them believe in baptismal regeneration. So we're having that debate on with two Dutch Reformed guys, which in terms of baptism, they're primarily related. Um, so that will cover that in some sense. I'm going to use that as a cover for that. And then we'll talk about baptismal regeneration and then we'll move on to something different because I really don't want to spend the whole rest of my next few months in baptism. Um, and then I might, after the baptismal regeneration, I may have one more episode of why I'm a Baptist with some of my favorite, uh, Baptist friends. So that's that. Um, in the last week we've gained three or four new patrons, I'm so thankful for that. Um, I put up a post on Instagram about, you know, what we're doing here. There's a lot of long-term stuff that I haven't talked about with anyone. Um, but there's a lot of stuff that's going to happen with this. And so the patronage is important. Um, and I, and I really appreciate it. Even if it's a dollar a month, it adds up. So if you feel led to please pray before it, please do not just do it, but pray and consider whether or not you want to be a part of the team. And then go to patreon.com slash Christ the Cure. And I've been trying to do the benefits. Um, seems like most people don't really care. They're just kind of like, oh, we're just glad to help. Love that. But I still want to do something for y'all. So whenever we get to 40 patrons, I'm going to do some kind of giveaway for um, the patrons there. Anyway, I hope this was helpful and beneficial. I purposely talked slower in this episode. I am working on it. I am working on it. Most of y'all have gotten used to it or just have adjusted the time on your player. So but you shouldn't have to adjust your player every time. So that's it. I hope you guys have a great weekend and God bless you all.